Bill Hatfield Remax team presents Real Estate and More. Bay Area real estate is different than in all of America. And why? What's up with home buyers? What's on sellers' minds? How is the market? And much, much more. Now, here's your host, Michael Hatfield. Welcome back to the Real Estate and More show, and I'm so glad you're here with us today. We have an exciting episode to uh, to go through, and on the show, we have a veteran a U.S. congressman to share his thoughts on what it's like to be an elected member in the House of Representatives. A wealth of knowledge, we have an exciting show planned talking about important issues, his thoughts, and on what is required to take on such a job in politics. A lot is happening very quickly as we approach the uh, 2024 presidential election in November, and it's good to hear insights of what may be going on in the nation's capital. William P. Bill Baker is an American businessman, a politician who has served six terms as a U.S. Assemblyman, two terms as a U.S. Congressman in the House of of representatives here to share his thoughts with us on these important topics is former u.s representative the honorable bill baker welcome to the show congressman baker well thank you it's good to be here oh it's great to have you well let's talk about your background it's not just something you can can do uh just start out in the house of representatives you got to earn your way to get there and i believe you were a local boy right from the very beginning were you not sure born and raised in oakland Oh, and my gosh. Of course, uh, we didn't start there. We started in the uh, assembly in the state state of California for uh-huh. uh, 12 years and then moved on to the to Congress. So we didn't begin there. I really began in the Coast Guard. Wow. The, the, you learned the most uh, in the military, huh? Yeah, that's correct. I'll be darned. Well, in your background, I noticed that you had something that is very um, admirable, admirable, and that is the earning of uh, the Boy Scout Eagle Scout Award. That's correct, and yeah. I'm still involved with uh, Los uh, Aguilas, uh-huh. the Eagles in Spanish. Uh, we have a local group of doctors and lawyers and businessmen who uh, meet regularly, and they plan an annual dinner for the new Eagle Scouts. Wow, that's yeah. incredible. And, you know, I got a funny story. When I was with the airline, I was a, a check pilot, and I had a guy, an ex-military guy, that flew the SR-71. And uh, here we are, I'm sitting in the captain's seat, he's checking out as a co-pilot, and I looked at, over at him and I said, you know, Don, that's really something. I mean, it makes you really feel proud to tell everybody about uh, being an SR-71 spaceship pilot. And he looks at me and he says, you know, I think I had more from being an Eagle Scout than I ever did from the SR-71. That's incredible. Good for him. Yeah, yes. well, good for you, yeah, too. You're always an Eagle, always a Boy Scout. Always. And, and it's hard to earn it, too, is it not? Well, it's a it's a challenge, and once you do that, I, I know people who have gotten jobs. A, a local fireman was hired because he was an Eagle Scout. Yeah. In other words, he set his goals and completed them, and uh, they like to see that. Employers like to see that. That's just absolutely amazing. So let's talk about the uh, the assembly. You started really about 1965. You you started uh, as a state. Uh, Senate file clerk, did you not? That's right. The The daily file is the agenda for the day. Oh, my. And so we, we prepared the agenda, and then I also called the roll in the Senate. Oh, my gosh. I did that for three years. It's It was an exciting time. So you get over your jitters of having to be in front of all of these uh, politicians by, by starting out early and, and learning to call the roll and know who they were and, and feel comfortable in that regard. That's that's a really great background, especially, um, you know, at, you were a pretty young age at the time. Well, I was in early, yeah, early 20s. Wow. Wow. And then you went from there. You became a budget analysis. Budget analyst. analyst. Yeah, yes. there we go. Yeah, for the Department of Finance. Wow. And under uh, Brown and Reagan both. Wow. Wow. Did you like that at all? Was it It epic? was fun and it prepared you for the budgets in the in the big house. So you really State knew State Assembly. You really knew from that background what it would do for you. And then you were executive vice president with the California Contra Costa Taxpayers Association. Correct. And I'm still an active member in that organization. You still you They st- analyzed the tax increases and things proposed on the ballot wow so we'll have a we'll have a bulletin out for this year it's a mile long oh my and then in 1980 to 82 you became an assemblyman that's correct and you did it you did it for a long time 12 12 years years Mm -hmm. wow you just liked it oh i loved it yeah i 
because I was a budget analyst, I uh, wound up on the Ways and Means Committee as a freshman, which is rare. Wow. And that's the committee that did all of the budgeting, all of the taxing, all of the spending. Wow. So That's just absolutely amazing to me. And then in 1993, what happened then? In uh, 92, I ran for the, uh, the big house, as I call it, <laughs> in the Congress, and spent four years there in Washington. Wow. You must have really enjoyed that back well, and forth. No, I, I did not enjoy that as much as the assembly because you're, you're basically part of a team and it's very partisan. And, uh, of course, we had Bill Clinton the whole time I was in there, so that wasn't a lot of fun either. Um, but mm-hmm. I'll tell you a little story uh, about how bipartisanship used to work in those days. Uh, we, we were there in 94 when... For the first time in 40 years, the Republicans took over the House, and Newt was elected Speaker. He went to Clinton and said, Mr. President, uh, we're going to approve budgets with only 2.8% increase in spending, and that's it. And I don't care if we shut down the government forever, we're going to do that. So he said, all right, all right. And so for three or four years, the budget was constrained on the spending side. It's never constrained on the taxing side. They love to tax, and they love to spend. And so uh, within two years, the budget was balanced. Spending uh, was overwhelmed by the new revenues, and the case Mm. is still true today. Mm. Revenues coming into the federal government uh, that you can't believe, but they always manage to outspend it and add to the deficit. The deficit now, interest on the national debt is as large as the defense budget. Oh, my. So it's just huge. And we've got to do that. We've got to cap their spending and allow revenue to catch up. You don't need new taxes. You don't need any bills. You just have to have restraint. Yeah. It's like your household bills. You know, if uh, if the wife is spending too much or you're spending too much, you just got to bring it in line with what's coming in on that paycheck. And I can see uh, the government is just a huge business, financially speaking. Uh, is that not correct? It should be. Yeah. It but it's not? Be. It's not, no, because they never have to balance so the politics uh, got politics become involved? And involved, and then, you know, as the bank will call you if you spend more than you take in, mm. and you'll you'll wind up in big trouble. With the government, is just put it off till next year and goes on to the national debt. And the problem, of course, is multiple, but um, other countries will stop buying our financial instruments, our bonds, and uh, they won't have faith in, in, in our debt, and so that will bring the parade to a to a halt. Mm. But I think before then, with this uh, new uh, bipartisan team that's developing with Robert F. Kennedy and J.D. Vance and, and Trump, I think you're starting to see some interest in changing the federal government, the way it behaves. And it'll be interesting. They're talking about health care and what they can do for children. Uh, areas you wouldn't talk about in the campaign is coming up. Mm. They, they want to make some changes to the federal government, and it's high, long overdue. Yeah, so that uh, be more fiscal responsibility, which we <laughs> don't really have fiscal responsibility, unfortunately. So in your view, uh, what have you seen over the last eight years or so wh- with our economy? What, it, what is the, the biggest um, points that you can you know, look at and say to our listeners? Well, we have our ups and downs, as you know, with the stock market and with the economy. Um, and I, I'm, of course, a financial advisor, so I'm very interested in how uh, the finances work and, and whether they work. Um, right now, uh, I think we're in, a, we're in a good position, and it's because um, of the tax cuts, not tax increases, that stimulated the economy eight years ago. Wow. So I'm especially interested in what may affect our housing industry being <laughs> being a uh, a realtor um, residential and commercial we're looking for um, things that happen or may happen in uh, the bills and legislation that may affect our home buyers and sellers so what are your thoughts uh, and opinion regarding the democrats proposal to tax so-called wealth and the unrealized gains that is disastrous and that if you can picture yourself as your house is your biggest investment and they tax it every year because you have unrealized gains. Now, I, I bought my home 50 years ago for in the, in the 90s, 90,000. It's worth millions now. If they tax that every year, where am I going to get the cash for that? 
Yeah. And and uh, you have to have adequate income. And so uh, stocks, if you own a portfolio in your retirement account, of stocks and bonds and you bought them 10 years ago, they're obviously higher or you wouldn't have kept them. And they'll tax that gain. Well, you have to sell something in order to get the money. And it's going to be very difficult for people. Um, when you think about the wealthy, oh, it's just the wealth tax is only yeah. going to affect the wealthy. It's going to affect everyone and in a very negative way. Mm. Taxing the uh, unrealized gains on a home is egregious. It is um, because it's not liquid. Yeah. And the point being is it can change because every day in the real estate market, the market goes up, the market goes down, and there's 50,000 various markets, real estate markets in our country. So now we're going to say the market out there uh, is the is pretty stable. I mean, it might grow a little bit here, there, a little bit there. But here in the Bay Area, you know, the market is very erratic. It can go up and a large degree. And if you get taxed at that point, you're, you're broke. Yeah. Um, but, I imagine you'd be taxed each year based on its value. Yeah, yeah. But you never know your real value until you sell it. You're absolutely correct. You know, you get a realtor or an appraiser come in, they say your house is worth this, and then you put it on the market and you can't sell it because the actual market or the, the, the buyers that show up with money in their pocket and the ability to pay for it are not there, you know, and it just happens. So and to me, it just it is not a good thing to to see a, a wealth tax and call it a wealth tax no. because it's uh, it's a misnomer it's not true well michael just a few years ago people were having bidding wars on your front porch yes you know i want this house so badly i'll pay three hundred thousand more than the listing yes now we're scurrying around trying to find a buyer who's liquid and wants to pay six percent which is a wonderful interest rate but it's not the three that we're used to we're going to take a short break we'll be right back Welcome to the Real Estate Minute with REMAX expert, Michael Hatfield. Michael, what traits should we look for in selecting an agent? Look for a deal maker with a positive attitude who will work tirelessly for you. An agent who is adept in multiple offer situations, drafting contracts, marketing and advertising a client's home, is familiar with multiple cultures, experienced in mortgage financing, inspections, and escrow, is a huge asset to his client. What can you do as a plus for clients? Your agent is your eyes and your ears, one who works behind the scenes on your behalf, a great attitude, working well with others, and keeping clients' priorities number one is a given for us. Call 925-322-7775 now to schedule an appointment or complimentary home analysis. For excellence in real estate, call the Michael Hatfield REMAX team at 925-322-7775 or go to michaelhatfieldhomes.com. Now, back to our show. Well, let's get back to the U.S. House of Representatives and how it works for our listeners. Let's talk about the U.S. House of Representatives and... You know, what does it have? 435 members maximum? Correct. Can you enlighten us on that? They serve, what, two-year terms? They're reapportioned every 10 years, and California lost one. Ah. Thanks. We, we take in hundreds of thousands of people over the border, but we still manage to lose the wealthy and the intelligent who are leaving this state because of all of its uh, taxing policies and its crime and the other problems that we're having. Mm -hmm. The bumpy roads going here in Danville from... Now, let's say Diablo Road south to Pleasanton is just a washboard, mm -hmm. and there's no excuse for it. Mm -hmm. Our taxes are high. Our gas tax is high. Um, they should be able to fix the roads, but this state has been under mismanagement for many years. Mm -hmm. Yes, I totally um, I have to <laughs> support your thoughts on that. And so now the House is responsible for making and passing federal laws. Um, how I know the House of Representatives is one of two different houses, the Senate as well as the House. And the House right now is virtually controlled by the Democratic Party. Is that still true? No, the House is run by the Republicans. And and Michael is the, uh, the Speaker of the House. And he's doing a good job. They have, a, they have about a five or six vote majority. Mm. Uh, it was run for years and years as Democrats, but mm. now it's Republican. And uh, with a fair reapportionment, it'll become more Republican. Mm -hmm. Now, how partisan is Congress? Very. Very. Yes, it's it's like two teams lining up and shooting at each other. <laughs> 
<laughs> but you try and, in the state, you try and get along with people on your committees and people that you meet daily. And in the state, it's very easy to do. And I I don't know now that uh, they're so lopsided whether they still contain that bipartisanship. But we did. I got along really well with Willie Brown. Surprised mm. most people. He was a, a very excellent speaker, but... Um, he, Interesting fellow. Yes, he uh, is. Yeah. So anyway, he's the boss. As long as you realize that, then you get along fine. <laughs> yeah. Actually, I knew Willie ba- Brown back in the days. I had the supermarkets, and um, he was friends with um, a reverend, a very respected uh, reverend in the community um, in Oakland. Mm-hmm. And uh, but anyway, I, I'd met him up several times and ran into him, you know, down the road fifteen years after I'd last seen him, and he was just as affable as he ever was. You know, yes. it's incredible. The leadership in the House includes the Speaker, Majority, and Minority leaders, Assistant leaders, Whips, and a Party Caucus or Conference. The Speaker acts as leader of the House, but what does the Majority and the Minority leaders really do? Well, they. They whip up the team just like the whip does and uh, get them to the battlefield and make sure they understand the bills. And, and uh, if, if they have a position on those measures, they let you know. So mm-hmm. it's, it's, it's basically an organizational tool. Mm-hmm. They help organize the Republicans. They also then assign people to the committees. So if you want to be on a certain committee, you put in for it and committees meet, the majority uh, leader and others will decide who gets on what committee. And it's based on your strengths, your backgrounds, your knowledge, at least it's supposed to be. Mm -hmm. Do they say, well, is it proportional to how many people that you represent in your constituency? No, they're all the same. They're all the same, okay, interesting. Now, when it comes to um, the committees, how important are those? Committees are very important. That's where the bills are mocked up and and, uh, and laid out, and they, they hear testimony from all the interested parties, like in your case, the realtors would come before <laughs> a committee and tell their, their view, and uh, representatives of the buyers and sellers would, would be there, and, and lending institutions. And mm-hmm. from that develops the bill. Wow. Mm. Well, I can see you, you've studied this for a few years, my friend. The Committee of the Whole House, what is that? It means that the whole house is together, or what does yes. that actually mean? They meet all together, mm-hmm. and it's rare. Some t- they do it to hear the president, ah. and uh, they give an annual address. And uh, last last year you saw Biden all amped up going, going to town, and everybody uh, was in the chamber. Uh-huh. And so um, it's, it's an... It's an interesting meeting, but nothing really gets done. You don't vote there. You, you don't uh, do bills or do anything mm-hmm. with the budget. You just you just meet and hear people. For instance, uh, we used to have uh, Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu come and address the entire Congress, in the, both meetings of the House and the Senate. So they would call a House meeting at that time? Uh, both. both. The House and Senate would meet together. Yeah. Wow. Which is pretty rare, is it not? Yes, it is. Wow, wow. Now, a commission. What does a commission do in the House? I don't know if there is a commission. They have they have a appointed certain committees uh-huh. to uh, look into matters and special committees, but I'm not sure they have a commission. Commissions are mainly from the uh, president. I see. And he would he would appoint commissioners and commissions to study various things. We have to realize you're dealing with a neophyte over here. I no, know you're doing about just government fine. Or, or whatever, but I'm having a fun time. So now, in an election such as the one we have and we'll see in November, can a person really make a dis- difference with their vote? Does it really matter? It seems like, you know, you just like, <laughs> well, they're, they're going to count these votes. They're not going to count these votes. Uh, I mean, does it really, really matter? Well, in certain areas, it matters a great deal. Uh, anywhere there's a swing district, a district that could go Republican or Democrat. Um, in the same with the governor and the senator's race, U.S. Senate. I think we're going to see a huge change in Nevada and Arizona when they elect their senators and and representatives. I think if people vote and turn out, they're going to they're going to have a wonderful result. Wow. So it 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 does matter, and we are as as the Democrats like to say we're a democracy. Then they go ahead and appoint their nominee for president, but. <laughs> Uh, it is it is a democratic republic. The republic sets the framework, and the democracy uh, elects them. 
and fortunately we have uh, the states participating in the end and so each state is represented by by their population mm-hmm. and their size and and uh, it allows the smaller states to participate not just the big five Texas and California New York so forth Illinois Wow yeah you got to understand all of that if you're going to be a public servant and run for office do you not yes you do it's it's important yeah you know where Nancy met you right do you remember no. she she was the uh, the secretary to the water district in Dublin for like 26 years no. before I managed to get the uh, the hook and get her out of there to come and help me well that was the original intention but what actually happened was uh, she came over and I started working for her that's a, <laughs> you have a you have a very intelligent view of your role <laughs> well what are you going to no, do I was happy to meet her and that's a that's a great water district they they produce more reclaim water than almost anyone they did and we need time. to use more on our freeways more on our uh, public parks and we have to expand the use of reclaim water so we'll have more fresh water for ourselves very well put. Well, back on the budget thing for a second, will, will the budget ever be balanced again? Do you think be, with this unity plan that, that there's a possibility it will get there at some point? Yes, I, I believe so. Um, you can't do it right away. For instance, the military has been so worn down, it has to be re- rebooted, and that's going to take a lot of money. Uh, we're now being threatened. Fortunately, China has their own economic problems, so they're not able to to take over Taiwan as they'd like to. Uh, We let, for some unknown reason, the Biden administration let Iran out of the box. And they were broke and unable to do their mischief in the Middle East. Now they're funding every terrorist group they can. They're rolling in oil money. Mm. And uh, why they decided to do that, I don't know. It's Mm. an administration that needs to be replaced. Mm. A lot of people will agree with you on that one. Well, what are your thoughts, uh, your opinion of our current foreign policy overall? I'll just expand on that a little bit. Well, weak is what it is, and and the people leading us aren't very knowledgeable in what they're doing, and uh, it's a disaster waiting to happen. But Mm. fortunately, as I mentioned, uh, China has their own problems. Russia is tied up in their own little war, and uh, President Trump has promised to uh, negotiate that out. Uh, right away at the beginning and that's mm. that's a war that's killing a lot of innocent people for no good reason mm. uh, I think I think Putin wants to uh, uh, recreate the Soviet Union take over his neighbors and have a larger area than Russia which is huge you don't need a larger area you just need mm. to develop it mm. and he's got the natural resources to do it oil and minerals I mean Russia could be a superpower if they didn't have the collectivist mentality and the the bad form of government but he's tied up, China's tied up, and we have an opportunity to reboot and uh, appoint some really good leaders. And I think with, when you see J.D. Vance and, and uh, uh, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. involved in it, you're going to see some new, new views on the world, starting again with uh, Robert Kennedy's favorite subject, and that's health care. He wants the kids to be healthier. He wants the country to be healthier, and I think he's going to be a really valuable asset. Mm. I was watching uh, the media the other day, and it was talking, uh, it was showing uh, the current uh, female candidate for president talking about price controls and how she would order price controls on the first day that she would be president. The issue that I see with that, it's not fiscally responsible or possible i think nixon tried it back in the 70s and it lasted like 65 days or 70 days and this just doesn't work there has to be other ways to solve um prices for goods and services that may be higher than they need to be Uh, so i saw that and also venezuela tried that too did they not yes they did and they're a disaster any group of people that thinks government control the economy is off on the wrong foot Mm. Uh, for instance let's say Eggs are too expensive. I'll set the price of eggs at a dollar, you know, a dozen. Wahoo, people cheer. That's just wonderful. And then the farmer get notices that his feed for the chickens is doubled. Yeah. And the energy to heat and to cool his aviaries, uh, that's gone up tremendously. His taxes have gone up. Uh, the, the taxes on his truck and the gas in his truck has gone up. And he's got all these rising costs 
but yet his output, his, his uh, revenue, has been fixed by the government, who, who knows absolutely nothing about egg production. So if whether it's eggs, I'm just using that as an example, or the price of your home, or whatever they set, it's, it's just unrealistic. They have no ability to judge the true costs. The only uh, thing that does is the marketplace. So most people uh, on the Republican side are free market folks. So we want to let the market determine the supply and demand. For instance, in real estate, use that as another example. When there's a lot of homes in the market, then it's a buyer's market. You can go out and pick between the various homes and drive the price down. When there's a shortage of homes in the market and many buyers, then the prices go up and they have these bidding wars that we mentioned earlier. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I, I hate to say this, but we have run out of time. I'm going to see if I can twist the arm of our uh, our um, congressman here to come back next week and, and tell us a little bit more. I've only got through about half of our our questions that we have and it's so interesting talking with someone that actually knows you've been listening to the real estate and more show and i'm michael hatfield we've been here with a u.s congressman retired bill baker and just having a great time thank you for for coming out and talking to our listeners michael it's my pleasure you well, have a great program uh, thank you we'll be back next week and be happy to have you tune in and visit with us have a blessed week Please remember to go to our new YouTube handle, My Real Talk Show. That's My Real Talk Show at YouTube.com and touch that subscribe button. You can also find past aired shows at our handle, My Real Talk Show on YouTube.com.